Here I am walking in Tidal Pop Island. Hmm, what should I do? Oh yeah, right. I'll try to shake down my tree from here. Oh yeah, peaches. Yum, yum, yum. Yum, yum, yum. Peaches. Just going to, uh, oh yeah, shake down tree tree. Of course. Oh, oh, just shake down tree. Yee. Yum, cherries. I to eat some cherries now. Ooh, I got, oh, I got hardwood, the wood, I have nuggets, even softwood. Wow, I even have party poppers. Ooh. I should have that cherry instead. One more cherry for me to eat. Hmm. What should I do? <clears throat> hmm. Um. I'll dig that up later. It will be fine. I cool. see that. I I need to record my lecture, honey. Wish I should go and take a nap. Please. Okay. That's just the very end. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night. And for nap. You say bye to everyone? Bye. Okay, bye Sammy. Shut the door. <laughs> oh. Good afternoon, software engineers. Oh. Okay, I know, I know. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. <laughs> Do not touch. Hope you're doing well today, software engineers. Today is ethics day, and not the ethics of having a five-year-old play Animal Crossing on a video, but no, we are going to talk about software engineering ethics. So let me, whoops. Let me... And, okay. So, slight trick today. Um, <clears throat> like I did the Animal Crossing thing last time, uh, everything is over here, not, I have to look over here. So, we're going to talk about basically the rest of this slide deck and get us ready for you to do guided practice H, the one on ethics, which is now available in grade scope. It was already available for you to look at. And then uh, we're going to have the live lecture tomorrow at 11 o'clock to talk about some of this stuff. And we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm going to try to use the breakout rooms in Zoom. 
Um, I haven't done this yet, but other people have, so hopefully it'll work out for us. If not, we'll have some fun chat about Animal Crossing. I don't know. We'll, we'll find stuff to do. So, jumping over here to ethics. <laughs> have you really thought about how pervasive software is in our lives? I mean, we kind of gotten used to it by now. Uh, just the fact that you know, we have incredibly powerful computers in our pocket, on our wrists, in our cars, um, you know, sitting around me right here. I have multiple things that have powerful uh, processing capabilities. I mean, even so far as to look at things just like things that manage traffic lights. You know, processing is everywhere. Computing is everywhere. A giant, very large UPS truck just backed into our driveway and the algorithms that they use to optimize their routes, you know, that's how they do their business. Have you ever thought about how much things could get screwed up if you did something untoward to, toward with uh, the power you wield as a software engineer? Think of all the data that is out there. Think of all the data you could potentially collect. If you're writing an iOS app or an Android app, I mean, just grabbing someone's GPS location alone could be creepy, but what if you were able to tap into their microphone or their camera? I know a lot of you have the, you know, the little slidey thing that goes over the, um, your, your webcams because you're afraid of, and rightfully so, of potentially apps taking control of the webcam and, and grabbing things before you have a chance to see what's going on. Or with maybe even turning off the notification that the camera is on in the first place. It's pretty pretty scary. So as a software engineer, what is your responsibility to society? What are the things you need to be thinking about so that you can make good decisions that benefit everyone that are out there for the common good? Um, I want to play this clip for you. And I think we can do this as picture in picture. We'll see how this works. If, if it doesn't, you should go and look at it on your own. Um, but let's just play. All right, so when the subroutine compounds the interest, right, it uses all these extra decimal places that just get rounded off. So we simplified the whole thing, and we just we round them all down and just drop the remainder into an account that we opened. So you're stealing? Uh, no, no, you don't understand. It's, uh, it's very complicated. It's, uh, it's, it's aggregate, so I'm talking about fractions of a penny here. And uh, over time... They add up to a lot. Oh, okay. So you're gonna make a lot of money, right? Yeah. Right? That's not yours? Uh, well, it, it becomes ours. How is that not stealing? I don't think, uh, I don't think that I'm explaining this very well. Okay. Um, the 7-Eleven, right? Mm -hmm. You take a penny from the tray. From the crippled children? No, that's the jar. I'm talking about the tray. The, the you know, the pennies for, for everybody. Oh, for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Well, those are whole pennies. Right. All right? Yeah. I'm just talking about fractions of a penny here, okay? But we do it from a much bigger tray, and we do it a couple of million times. So what's wrong with that? So what's wrong with that? So what's wrong with that? If for some reason the audio didn't play, um, I'll check it later. But if it didn't play, go back, and, and the link is in the, is in the comments. It's also there on the slide. It's also on the lecture notes. Um, but, you know, the main character there, talking to Jennifer Aniston's character, is saying, look, you know, they're fractions of a penny. They're rounding error. You know, we're just putting them in account. What does it matter? What does it matter? Turns out they had an off by one error, and they were not grabbing fractions of a penny. They were grabbing much larger things, and they were basically stealing millions of dollars very quickly. So um, if you've never seen the movie Office Space, spoilers. Uh, but it's, it's worth going to watch. Um, it's kind of a cult classic as far as uh, Office politics, software engineering, you sort of stuff. So, you know, take a look at that. Wally, I discovered a deadly safety flaw in our product. Who should I inform? No one. The stock would plunge and we'd have massive layoffs. Your career would be ruined. But my negligence could cause the deaths of a dozen customers. The first dozen is always the hardest. Where is the line? I mean, this is obviously tongue-in-cheek. Tongue this is, I mean, it's Dilbert. It is what it is. But where is the line? If there's a bug in the software you know is going to inconvenience, let's not go to death. It's a little extreme. But let's say it's going to inconvenience maybe 
0.1% of your user base. 0.1% of your user base, when they run your software, it erases their hard drive. I mean, that's a little bit more than inconvenience, but you, you get the point. Like, it does something that's non-lethal. 0.1%. But you have to ship. And your company is depending on the software being shipped, and your livelihood as a software developer is contingent on this software shipping. Do you let it go? Do you not? Who do you tell? What do you tell them? Do you go to your manager? Do you go to the press? Do you think the press cares? Or no? To help software engineers address these things, the ACM and the IEEE got together and they put together the Software Engineering Code of Ethics um, uh, back in 1994, and they kept revising it through the, the late 90s. Now, you might say that this is 2020. Does this even apply now? I, I think you'll find that when you look at it, it, it still does apply. The, the, the concepts of being ethical in software engineering, I mean, there's new things to think about, such things like digital surveillance and things like, um, you know, how much data do you keep about people? Uh, those things have changed the, the conversation slightly, but the overarching principles are still the same. Um, it's been edited multiple times. I've got the link right here. We're going to talk about parts of it. And then also the link is right here, and I will make sure it's in the lecture notes as well. The preamble, software engineers shall commit themselves to making the analysis, specification, design, development, testing, and maintenance of software. Oh, it's like they know the phases of software. A beneficial and respected profession. In accordance with their public commitment to the health, safety, and welfare of the public, Software engineers shall adhere to the eight principles, which sounds like you're joining a secret society, honestly, particularly since they're capitalized. And, you know, you know, ask Horton, you know, he rolls up the sleeve. He has like this, this, you know, eight sided symbol here with a keyboard and a mouse. It's pretty, pretty legit. Um, uh, so what are these eight principles? So the basic idea of the eight principles, are, these are kind of the high level categories. Uh, the public, your employer um your customer uh your colleagues that sort of thing and we, they they uh put different clauses under these different principles so each of those relates to kind of a category of behavior that you have you would interact with customers differently you interact with your colleagues that sort of stuff um the purpose of the code of ethics is not just for software developers and engineers it's meant for management it's meant for uh, anyone that interacts with software engineers uh, policy makers, um, you know, people in the government, they're going to make decisions about how technology operates within a country or in whatever municipality we're talking about here. Um, and um, it, it's not like a hard and fast, here is rule number one, rule number two, rule number three. There, these, these clauses kind of provide context, I guess, is a way of thinking about it, um, such that there is an actual kind of disclaimer on the code. It is not intended that the individual parts of the code be used in isolation to justify errors of omission or commission. The list of principles and clauses is not exhaustive. The clauses should not be read as separating the acceptable from the unacceptable in professional contact, conduct in all practical situations. The code is not a simple ethical algorithm that generates ethical decisions. I love that line. You know that one was written for the CS majors out there, right? In some situations, standards may be in tension with each other or standards with other sources. These situations require the software engineer to use ethical judgment to act in a manner which is most consistent with the spirit of the code of ethics of professional practice, given the circumstance. Basically, this ain't the Ten Commandments. This is not meant to be, oh no, I'm in a situation. Because of paragraph two, clause seven, this is how I should act. No, it's more parable level i guess uh it's more you know um folk tale fairy tale that's that's pushing it. it it's it's things you should think about i suppose and there's gonna be plenty of times when you when there's a situation that you could find clauses that tell you to do different things or, or imply different things is it super helpful i mean yeah it really is helpful to look at this because it's good to get kind of a foundation under your feet as opposed to just kind of floundering about like, what should I, what should I do? Even if that foundation is going to pull you in different directions. So you, it's not, it's not the end all be all. It's not the algorithm that tells you what to do, but it is what helps you make those decisions. So the eight principles are public, 
which is you always should work with the public interest in mind, the client and employer. You should act in the manner that is in the best interest of your client and your employer at the time, consistent with that public interest. What you're going to find is these principles kind of most important, next most important, next, it kind of ticks downward. Uh, the product, the software engineer should always ensure the product uh, is the highest standards that you could produce. Your judgment, you shall maintain integrity and independence and professional judgment. These are things like non-disclosure agreements or corporate espionage or, you know, that sort of stuff. Citing the right people, following licenses. Management, software engineering managers and leaders shall subscribe to and promote an ethical approach to management of development maintenance, i.e., no 80 hour work weeks, no crunches, no things that would be detrimental to the health and safety of a software engineer in the pursuit of their career. Your profession, um, you should always advance the integrity and reputation of the profession. So don't spread the whole, hey, we're a bunch of software developers. Yeah, Cheetos and Doritos and Mountain Dew slam a jamma in the dark with my glow in the dark x files poster sitting yeah you, you know the picture i'm thinking of um we all know that software engineering is an incredibly social profession not only are you interacting with customers and you're interacting with ma management you're acting with your team you have to know how to get along with people you have to know how to uh, divide up tasks you have to know how to negotiate with the people you're working with to know what you're actually going to be building um, it is not an isolation sport, even though we're now kind of in isolation. But you know what I mean. And if your colleagues are suffering, it is on you to toss them a lifeline. You know, if if someone is having trouble developing module A, you could ignore the problem and hope they're fired. Thus, module A gets put into the software and it's crappy and the software has issues or you have to go in and fix it at the time. Or you can work with that person, help get them up to speed, and have a better product and hopefully a better team worker moving forward. Which is better. And then finally for yourself. Um, we all know that computer science and software, software engineering is a rapidly changing field. I cannot keep up with every new library or every new technique or every new platform or whatever and i you know i mentioned this at the beginning of the semester students come in and say oh man why aren't we learning whatever framework that google just came out with and it's like look dude i can't i can't i can't you know i'm trying to keep up and you know we move forward as best we can but we want to make sure we're on stuff that people are going to are still using that sort of thing but it is a professional responsibility to continue to um self-learn Learn those new libraries. Learn the new techniques. Keep up with, with where the technology is going. So um, if we look at the code itself, coming over here and scrolling down, uh, you see the eight principles are outlined. And then under eat, this is part, I, I copied part of the preamble um, into the, the slides for you. And then down here we have the clauses. So principle one, public, two, three, four, five seven and eight um i absolutely do not expect you to memorize any of these if and when i ask you a quiz question about the code of ethics i will provide you with a copy of the code of ethics i guess you could just actually just go to the internet right i mean i have a handout that i give people when they take the quiz in class shocker i ask questions about the code of ethics in class but now you could just like go to the website kind of handy actually so um, I'm going to go through a few of the clauses um, just to give you a flavor for them and, you know, kind of go from there. So first in the public, moderate the interests of the software engineer, the employer, the client, and the users with the public good. So just because um, you've been hired to do something in particular um, and the client wants something in particular, there is the notion of well, what is the best for the public. And there could be overriding reasons why you might say eh, we might not want to build this this particular way. Um, that could be not necessarily, hey, I'm building a doomsday weapon. Um, it could be uh, I'm going to use substandard security protocols um, because I'm trying to get the software out when in reality it's probably in everyone's best interest to take the time to build it right. Uh, approve software only if they have well-founded belief it is safe, meets specifications, it passes appropriate tests. Basically, you don't sign off on something unless you're sure it's the best work and it's not going to hurt anyone. 
physically or monetarily or however you think about it. Disclose to the appropriate persons or authorities any actual potential danger to the user. Uh, whistleblower clause. There you go. It's in there. Client employer. Employer. Provide service in the areas of competence. Being honest and forthright about any limitations. Um, yeah. You might not want to sell yourself as a cybersecurity expert if you've never had a cybersecurity class or we're not like on the cybersecurity team or, you know, have other reasonable expectations. You know, if you're in an interview and they're like, hey, you look great. We'd love to hire you. Um, do you know anything about Angular, Angular TM? And you're like, uh, sure. I know all about Angular T. Don't lie to people. I mean, it's, in your best interest, still in the end, to be upfront about what your technical skills are. You know, you could say, I'm not familiar with that particular library, but from what I've heard of it, it works kind of like this, and I've experienced learning libraries and, and picking. That's where you should be going with this. Don't oversell yourself. Be, you know, be, be honest. Be honest about what you know, what you can do. Not knowingly use software that is obtained or retained either Ill illegally or unethically. Have you ever used software that was pirated? Mm. I'm putting this on the internet, so I guess I'm not going to... Back in college, you know, back in those days when... For some reason, Photoshop was the one everyone was downloading um, when I was in college. I don't know why. It's not like we were doing anything interesting with Photoshop in the you know early 2000s. But it's kind of... That was just the thing everyone was trying to get. I don't know. Uh, Windows XP, Windows 95, those were pretty popular. So eh, don't do that. Don't do that. You're going to have a job. You'll have money. I promise. It, it, it will, it, it's really okay. You want to support other developers. Keep private any confidential information gained in their professional work. Uh, don't go, you know, corporate espionage on people. Product. Strive for a high quality, acceptable cost, and reasonable schedule, ensuring significant trade-offs are clear to and accepted by the employer and client. Build good stuff and make sure people know what you're building and make sure they know what the cost trade-offs are. Yeah. Uh, identify, define, and address ethical, economic, cultural, legal, and environmental issues. So basically look at the software and say, huh, this software could turn off the power grid. That could be a problem. You know, identify those and make sure people are understand what's going on up front. Ensure you're qualified to work on the product. This goes back to the one we just talked about in, in principle two. Ensure an appropriate method is used for any project in which they work or propose to work. Should this be plan-driven or should it be agile? If you're building something that has to go to the FDA and it's going to be software running a pacemaker, probably plan -driven. You know, that's part of your responsibility. Make sure we're doing things the right way. Judgment. Maintain professional objectivity with respect to any software. Uh, don't engage in deceptive financial practices. Disclose to all concerned parties those conflicts of interest. So this would be something like... Um, if you were a software developer and on the side you built, you know, your own library, your own pieces, your own tool, and then in your company you said, man, that, that software, we really need to buy a site license for that because that's really what we need here to make our company take off, you know, don't, yeah, that's, don't be skeezy, you know, just buy the software you need to buy and don't, you know, if there's a conflict of interest because you have a financial stake in something, make sure people know about that. We actually have that clause at UVA for all the faculty members. Anytime that we do any sort of consulting or do a startup or anything like that, we have to report to the university how much time we spend on that and if we've used any university fund, any university materials. Like, did we do any of the work in our office or on our UVA machines? And that does actually start making some interesting... Interesting might not be the right word. Some quandaries... Um, management. Ensure good management for any project on which they work, including effective procedures for promotion. Uh, ensure software engineers are informed of standards. Ensure software engineers know employers' policies on passwords and files and, and data management. This is something that's very important at UVA. Um, we, we do make sure that all faculty have at least some training in what educational records are and what and how much uh, protection they need to use and what software they are or are not allowed to use. And if you're gathering things that are sensitive, like um, social security numbers or um, uh, grades, are you protecting them in the appropriate way? Uh, we do try to make sure we do that sort of training at UVA. 
assign work only after taking into account the appropriate contributions in education. So this goes back to the don't put people on something that they don't necessarily have experience in. Uh, in your profession, promote the public knowledge of software engineering. Hey, software engineering is a good thing and we do good stuff. There is a there is the you know the the meme, the the public perception that software engineers just hole up all day in front of a machine and type and, and are on video conferencing. And that might be our life right now. But that's not the reality of what software engineering is all always about. Um, so, yeah. Uh, don't pr promote your own interests at the expense of the profession. Obey all laws governing work. Okay, yeah. Take responsibility for detecting, correcting, reporting errors in software. You know, if you see a bug, you shouldn't just go, Ooh, that was Sally. Ooh, hope no one catches her. You know, you should, you know, report the bug. Um, avoid association with business or organizations which are in conflict with this code. So don't work with the mafia, I guess. <laughs> I, I mean, there's some obvious jokes here. You could, you, you can kind of picture where the obvious jokes go. Assist colleagues in professional development. It is on us to make sure that we are all pull each other up by our bootstraps and work together to build good stuff. Make sure you credit people the work that they do. Make sure you're putting those, like if you get a UI from someone for a website you're building, put in the footer, you know, copyright, you know, design by, give a link. You know, let's be nice to each other. Come on, y'all. Um, and review the work of others in objective, candid, and properly, <laughs> objective, candid, and popular, properly documented way. You're in a code review and you're like, oh my gosh, Bob wrote this code. I can't stand reading Bob's code. Bob's code is if he had he wrote it on paper, put it through a scanner, had an OCR go through it, then tried to read it into Microsoft Word, save it as an MP3, and then play it back for Siri to transcribe in code. It is so bad. That's what it's like to try and read his code. Um, try to be fair with people. Um, we're all coming at our professions from different backgrounds, different different places. Um, be honest and forthright with the errors that you see, and don't exaggerate and go too nuts. Um, for self, further your knowledge of the development and analysis specific, you know, keep learning about how software development works, improve your ability to create better software. So, you know, keep practicing, improve your ability to create accurate, informative, inform, talking, informative and well-written documentation. Make sure you're documenting your software well for others. And we've talked about what that means. And then recognize that personal violations of this code are inconsistent with being a professional software engineer. <clears throat> Now, it's not like that the code of ethics police are going to come to your door. This is something that you should read and internalize and kind of, you know, a lot of these are common sense. Um, but what isn't here? Well, where do you get help? Let's say you're in a dilemma. You don't know what to do. The code's not going to tell you what to do. Uh, some companies have HR hotlines that you can take advantage of where there are HR professionals that can help you work through interpersonal things. Um, depending on how much you trust your manager or if the manager is the problem, that's usually a good place to go. Going over a manager's head to the next level is very dangerous. Um, I mean, it depends on the organization. Um, but, you know, you, you're possibly burning bridges. Um, something to think about. Uh, if there are violations, where do you report them? It's not like you're going to call up the IEEE or the ACM. It's like, hey, I hear they're doing some crazy stuff down at wherever, Capital One. I don't know. Probably not Capital One. I'm sure the Capital One, Capital One are good people. I know they are because some are in the class. Um, where do you get advice and support? What are the consequences? What do you do if there's a conflict between the client and the employer? If the client says, hey, I need you to build this software so that there's an emergency button that I can get into anyone's computer, and the employer's like, uh, no, maybe we need the contract. What do we do? Um, yeah, these aren't easy questions. Um, and not necessarily you're going to be the one making all these decisions, but you need to know that there is guidance out there. There is... Um, from our professional organizations, there is information that you can reference. There are almost always ways that you can get advice through your company, through your organization to help, you know, navigate some of this. Um, hopefully you'll never be in this position. Um, it's more, this sounds terrible. It's more likely that there'll be an HR issue, which happens in every office, office environment. Unfortunately, there are just things that happen. Um, 
not as much necessarily you're building a doomsday device but it's it's something that you that you should think about so this brings us to tomorrow and to guided practice h in guided practice h let me pull it up Student resources guided practice I have two scenarios for you here, okay? One about Andrea Babbage and one about Larry Jones. And there are four questions that you need to answer. Um, I highly suggest, require a strong, but I want you to work with other people and talk about these situations. This is what we're going to do on Thursday. On Thursday, I'm going to um, start the discussion, talk about the code of ethics, answer any questions, and then hopefully we'll live go into breakout rooms for you to talk with other people about these scenarios. We'll come back together and talk about your solutions uh, or what you decided to do. And then um, you'll type that up and then you'll submit this by Saturday for Guided Practice Age. If you can't make it on Thursday, that's totally fine. You can work on it on your own um, or, or with another person. Please try to work with at least another person. Um, it's good for us to have connections with other people in the class nowadays. Um, but that's the plan. Okay, so hopefully that helps. Hopefully that's something for you to think about. Um, this is what uh, quiz six is going to be about is uh, licensing and ethics. Uh, it's just this one week of material. Uh, so I'll see hopefully a lot of you on Thursday. If not, um, if you have any ideas of things you'd like for me to talk about next week, please do let me know. Otherwise I'll do things like animal crossing i hope you have a great day bye gang